Father, thank you that your word is being presented to us in different formats to make us hunger for it. Your word says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst. It is the hungry and the thirsty that you feed. Give us spiritual hunger for the things of God and help us to put premiums on spiritual things. This evening, speak to our hearts, correct our lives, and let us not leave here the same because of the impartation of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power might be of you and not of us. Lead us, help us, and minister to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are all welcome to our usual annual um, Valentine's Day session. This year, Valentine's Day is falling on a, a Tuesday. So you are having pre-Valentine. I also bring you greetings and blessings from Bishop Dagwood Mills. Who is the author of the book I'm using tonight. My task is to speak on faithfulness and unfaithfulness in marriage. Um, I think that faithfulness, first of all, is God's nature. And in order to be faithful, we need the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because most of us will not naturally be faithful. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it is said that if you want to know how promiscuous a male can be, look at the animal kingdom and appreciate the fact that the male animal has more females that maybe he sleeps with than the female has. But I would say, yes, we may have to look at that to look at how we are when the Holy Spirit is absent or how we are when the Spirit of God and the presence of God is not with us because animals don't have the presence of God. So anything in fair, they will sleep with it. But you are not called by God to be that. And... It is the absence of the Holy Spirit that brings about the animalistic tendencies in us and makes us, excuse me to say, behave like them. But when you become born again, the Bible says, set your affection on things that are above. It means that there are things that are below. But when you set your affection on things that are above, you now begin to even yearn for things that are above. Also, if the male animal is indiscriminate in the number of partners, so is the female dog. The female dog is an area dog and is not faithful to any dog. The female dog, sometimes we put things under our gate so that she will not go. Anything she meets, she sleeps with. So the animal kingdom is not even only male. It cuts across. So if we want our animal tendencies to be manifest, then it's not going to be easy in the world. Because a female dog will also behave like the female dog. Amen? Sometimes you have a dog before you know, she's coming from on top of the hill. She has slept with Billy the dog, uh, uh, John the dog. You don't want that. So I believe that the animal kingdom shows us how we would be if God were to leave us like that. It will not be good. And then we will also collect diseases from wherever we are. And also you don't, um, animals don't even have a relationship. Anybody you see, anybody that attracts you, you just flow. You know, but God is the author of marriage. So he brings us into covenant with him and with one another. And when he does that, I think that he sort of promoted us 
and respected us more than the animal kingdom. Amen. Um, we may have some animal tendencies, but we become more like that when we go scot-free and nothing, nothing controls us, nothing disciplines you, whatever you feel like doing, you do. Animals don't even cook their food because as soon as they see it, they feel like eating it, so they eat it. You know, so honestly, to allow animal tendencies, God knew that it will not be good for you. Animals don't cook their food. They don't have plates and cutlery. They don't set any table. I mean, really, they are really, really down there. Do you understand? So when God calls you and comes to live in you and gives you light, he's actually promoting you Hallelujah. and giving you a higher life in him. Amen, somebody. So let's allow the Holy Spirit. And I think that we have the mind that um, when we have that freedom and that liberty, then we are really enjoying. It's unfortunate. Because I know a lot of men who were unsaved, who are saved now, and who don't want that old life again. Because the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. So when I sit in full gospel meetings and all that, the, the people who didn't know God, they were unchained. But when they come to know God and the Holy Spirit lives in them, your desires even change. And you don't want certain things in a certain way of life. Amen, everybody. Amen. So faithfulness is God's nature. And when he comes to live in us, he imparts that nature to us. What does Lamentations 3.22 say? It says that your mercies are renewed every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen? Great is thy faithfulness. And because God lives in us, somebody should be able to say to you, great is thy faithfulness. And that left to me alone, I can't live this life. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can. And the Holy Spirit is an empowering presence. It is true. That is why Paul, who was a murderer, can be changed. And he said that I am what I am by the grace of God. So if God's faithfulness is great, then you and I also can have great faithfulness in our lives. Amen. Amen. Now, faithfulness, the second thing is that faithfulness counts in hard times. Faithfulness counts in hard times. Revelations 2, verse 9 to 10. Is it going to be on the screen? Or? Revelations 2, verse 9 to 10. Ah, okay. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Amen. Amen. Faithfulness is not faithfulness unless it's been tried. Faithfulness is not faithfulness unless it has gone through some tribulation. Amen? Amen. So you don't know whether you are faithful unless you are tried. Or you are tempted. Amen? Amen? And God gave John the Revelator this message. And he said that, look, I know where you are dwelling. And I know that you will be tried. I know you will be cast into prison ten days. I know you will have tribulation. So I know you will have all these difficulties. But what I have to tell my church is that, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. So faithfulness is not faithfulness unless you've had some challenges. Amen, somebody. Amen. And when you were getting married, you read too many books, you watched too many movies, and you are shocked 
that there are temptations and trials and tribulations in a relationship. Sometimes when I muse about it, I'm surprised that we are shocked. Because our relationship with God, who is one perfect person, is fraught with so many problems. Sometimes we even have a lot of suspicion against him. So that he has to come and write 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon me because I care for you. He has to tell you, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. And he has to say, plans of prosperity and not of evil. Why does he have to say that when he is God? Because you are prone to think that he has plans of evil. And then he says to bring you to the expected end. So if you are expecting a life, flowery beds of ease, then your faithfulness is not going to be proven. Your faithfulness, my faithfulness, will be proven by the things that we go through. Amen, somebody. And a marriage goes through so many seasons. A marriage goes through so many things. A marriage goes through so many tests. And it is in the midst of that that God calls us to be faithful not outside them. Amen. Amen. Please, am I making sense? Oh, God <laughs> so, you know, just the preceding verse in Revelation 2, 9, what God is saying is that, I know that people talk about you. I know that there are Satan-induced tests. And some of the tests last for 10 days. When I was studying to come, and I read 10 days, I said, oh, wow. At least he told us the number of days. But some of the trials, you don't know the days. Like when Joseph was in prison. I mean, he was in Egypt for 13 years. Why does it have to take so long? I don't understand God. But if I understood him, then he would be human like me. But he's God. That's why I don't always understand him. Amen. And so, expect your faithfulness to be tested in this journey we call marriage. Those of you here, those of you out there online who are not married, expect tests, expect tribulations, expect you'll be thrown into prison where you want to get out, but it's like you are locked. Amen? And God says, be thou faithful unto death. And what do we say? at our marriage vows till death us do part you thought it was a nursery rhyme but as you are growing up you've seen that it is a vow and it is a covenant amen, amen. now how can we define faithfulness so i'll come to the different circumstances that try marriages but when we look at first corinthians 4 2 which is a catch verse in the UD. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithfulness, it's not a favor. When you are faithful to your wife or you are faithful to your husband, you are not doing your spouse a favor. Amen? I once was pulled into a counseling session at the Kodesh and the lady was saying you you are lucky you don't know do you know what the bank girls do and then i turned to her and i said lady are you a child of god or you are a bank girl which one are you i'm saying you you are lucky do you know what bank girls do you are not a bank girl you are a child of god the holy spirit lives in you God sent his son to help you and I so that we can overcome. Amen. So you are not what people do. You are not what people do in workplace affairs. You are not what people do when they are commuting to work. Amen. I know a lady who lost her marriage because she was picking up her children from school. And they had a friend, also a guy, who was also picking up his children from school. 
and dropping them. So when they drop the children, then after that, they'll have a long chat because the lady was working at home and the man too had his own business. Then he developed it to let's have a coffee and let's have a this and let's have, and before we knew, both marriages were destroyed. Do you see? So we are not called to be like everybody. And faithfulness is not a, a favor. You are doing your wife. Do you know how the girls in the office, the girls in the church, they even admire me. You nah, you are lucky. Really. Your faithfulness is to God. Remember Joseph. There was nobody there. Nobody knew him as a Jew. Nobody knew him as a Christian or the one who served the living God. Egypt was unbeliever territory. Mrs. Potiphar was a powerful woman who could have arranged a visa and a ticket for Joseph to go back to Canaan. Because when you know a powerful woman, you become powerful yourself. Amen. When we were in Legon, some of the boys had powerful mamas and aunties coming to visit them and uh, 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 providing for them in various there was a term for it, sectioning them or something anyway spreading. spreading them yes and i hear that such men are called toy boys and then sugar mummies amen joseph had all this and in his case he wasn't even trying to sleep with potiphar's wife is the madame herself who was chasing him. And some of you would have said, what scholarship is this? And when you come home and you see your wife, she'll, you'll say, hmm, she's not even corporate. She's not even powerful. If she knew the powerful women looking for me at my workplace, now when I call her, she will down. <laughs> you see, we think about the wrong things and we think the wrong way. But what did Joseph say to Potiphar? He said that God forbid that I should sin against God. He was conscious of the God who says that all things are naked unto him with whom we have to do. Amen. So our propensity is to be unfaithful. I remember some years ago, a pastor's wife, not in my church, called me and said, I work at this high corporate place. You are somebody I knew. And she said that there's a guy I work with in the office. And Auntie Mami, seriously, I'm falling for him. So I asked her why. She said, because this is my pastor husband. Of course, uh, he will never come home. He comes in the night. But when I get to work, I open the door. The guy says, hi, beautiful. Good morning. Auntie Mom, he has not even greeted me at home. And then she said that he would always have breakfast, whether it's croissant, whether it's Danish pasties. He would come with it and he would say, Oh, I didn't eat breakfast because I knew that I was coming to the office so that I would share with you. She doesn't know the last time her husband asked her what she's even eating. The best he does is to buy water in leaves. But anyway, she was calling not because it was a funny matter. She was calling because she found herself walking on a road she didn't want to walk on. So she said that at lunchtime too, he would say, oh, let's just go to the canteen downstairs and eat. So she realized that Things were moving very rapidly, and she needed some help. So what should she do? I said, leave the office immediately. Tell them you need a change. Tell them you can't be in that office. What, anyway, they were gracious enough to change her place. But I said to her that this is just office romance. You don't know how the person is if you marry him. But Satan always uh, packages things in scintillating and tintillating ways. And it makes us feel, oh, this is my husband. I don't know the last time he even said I look beautiful. The only time he talks is when it's not nice. When it's nice, he never says anything. So, you know, 
what you are comparing is not real. Because in marriage, you, you talk about finances. You talk about don't leave the wet towel on the bedroom, whatever. You talk about where you put your socks. You put, talk about your food is coming soon. All these things don't feature in the office program. Do you understand? And therefore, you have a false sense. And what does the Bible say? It says that we should beware of the wiles of the devil. And wiles are defined as cunning procedures. Procedures that you don't know that one will lead to two. Or sometimes you even know, but you think you are enjoying it. That it's a whiff of uh, fresh air. But God's word is still the same. Even when there's nobody there like Joseph, you should say to yourself, God forbid that I should sin against God. The God they don't even know. They don't even know your standards. They don't know that Christianity says you shouldn't have a frolicking time with somebody who is not your spouse. They don't know that. So Joseph could have just gone in. And then later, your faithfulness leads you to prison. I mean, come on. Your faithfulness did not pay off. But it may take a while, but God's word stands. Amen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. So faithfulness is a requirement. It's not a, it's not a favor. It's not discretionary. Okay? And then faithfulness is to God and not to um, a human being. Because sometimes if the human being is not there, you will do what you want to do. And faithfulness could also be said to be the cornerstone of the character of a person. Because it is a pattern which we see in relation to God, church work, activities, friends, and secular work. So, usually, or always, if you are unfaithful in one area, it will spill into the other. You will steal, you will be deceptive, you will start to hide a lot of things. You, will, you know, one lady was just laying in the bed and she saw... Um, a slip for a um, pediatric department. So, and she saw that the name written is baby something, her husband's surname. So, I know them, they, are, they were in church, but anyway. So, she waited and she asked him, ah, who is this baby? He said, one of my patients. He said, but you are not in pediatrics at all. You are adult medicine, so how come? So I was helping somebody in the end, turns out it was his child. Wow. You see, so one thing leads to another. Because you've been living a secret life, you have secret text messages, secret phones. Even one lady, she had a phone her husband didn't know about. And I had to deal with that case. It was very, very stressful. Because a man even pulled out a knife. As Bishop says, all my stories are true. So, faithfulness is a cornerstone of character. When you are unfaithful in one area, it will spill into other areas. And faithfulness in one area of life may be indicative of possible unfaithfulness in others. Now, what are the circumstances that test our faithfulness? Sickness. Sickness can test your faithfulness. One gentleman... I knew he was actually a pastor in our church and his wife got sick and so because of that he couldn't have sexual relations with her and it was a very trying time at a point she even got paralyzed and in her paralysis he slept with his wife and she got pregnant and the family came to the house with kings now why why and my husband said to me, people are very wicked. I am sure that he didn't mean to make his wife pregnant, but where should he go? I was surprised in my head that paralysis too. Amen. <laughs> you are amazing. But anyway. So in the end, the pregnancy was induced. In the long run, the lady succumbed to death. You know, but um, that's why you come and say in your marriage vows, in sickness and in health. But you see, we don't think about the vows deeply. 
So when they say in sickness and health, you think, oh, Benya malaria be. You know, and the brothers, sometimes you are sick. And we expect that every part of your body will be sick. But it doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> and it seems that this area can become malaria medicine. So Job was struck with boils and all that. And the wife said, just curse God and die. You see, because your situation is too bad. So sickness is that. That's so the people who wrote the vows, they knew what they were writing. That's why they said that. In sickness and in health. Eh? In adversity and prosperity. But you haven't thought about it. You are just thinking about your wedding colors, your wedding gown, how you and the groom will make a grand entrance, choreography. Beloved, you stood before God and all of us to say in sickness and in health. Because sickness is something that challenges your faithfulness. Amen. Childlessness. Childlessness. When Rebecca was getting married, she didn't know she would be childless. And Isaac was 40 years old. Now that I know what I know, sometimes I wonder whether Isaac himself was not part of the problem. But the thing is, in life, we don't choose our problems. So I get surprised when people are very arrogant. Oh, she can't have a child. As if you are God. Are you the one who gave yourself a child? You had nothing to do with it. So childlessness can also lead to unfaithfulness. Like in Abraham's case, he wasn't having a child with Sarah. And Sarah said, you know, Hagar is younger. She's agile. She's this soul have a child with her, and then after I'll take the child and make the child ours. Look at the problems it has brought up to today. Look at the problems in the Middle East because of Abraham's small unfaithfulness engineered by his wife. Most of you will go for Hagar yourself. But in Abraham's case, so let's divide the word of God properly. Don't say Abraham was a polygamist. Because he didn't even choose a guy. He didn't marry her. Amen, somebody. But Sarah said, here you are, Abraham. Be happy. And after that, her whole household was unstable. So yes, childlessness can push you. You see, I like to be practical. If childlessness drove the father of faith and the woman on the role of honor, then you... Is your name written in Hebrews 11? Why are you so confident? Amen? Childlessness. Then childbirth. Childbirth can, can test your faithfulness. Because your wife has given birth. Her womb has not returned. And you want action. Or sometimes the doctor says... Bed rest. Don't let anybody touch you. And you are even angry with the doctor. You've been insulting him in the house. But he's trying to help you have the baby. Then you'll be telling your wife, Sir Doctor, will you cry? Hey, Papa, Sisano, Sisano. <laughs> now let me say here that all things being equal, pregnancy and childbirth is, does not connote lack of sex. There's no such thing. It does not uh, uh, affect the baby in a negative way. Please, it does not. So those of you who are using that as an excuse, it's only the brothers who are clapping. And medical science has proven that when you are getting close to labor, and you have action. It rather helps the baby to come. You see, God knew all these things. So some of the embargoes, they are human and place embargoes. Not medical, not spiritual, but you heard it from your mother. Amen, ladies. Amen. 
So please, when I say childbirth, I'm not talking about the whole gamut of pregnancy. The ladies, don't say that this high hill, you want to lie on it. <laughs> Model marriage shows various ways and various styles for action. Amen. Another thing, sit down, please. <laughs> Another circumstance that tests our faithfulness is sudden prosperity. Sudden prosperity. Amen. When the men prosper, they seem to think they need more wives. When you prosper, you have more admiration from the opposite sex. When you prosper, the Bible says that when riches are increased, they be increased that eat them. You know, and God knows that you have the propensity. That is why <laughs> in Deuteronomy chapter 8, from 12 to 14, Deuteronomy 8, 12 to 14, it says that when thou art eaten, when lest thou art eaten, and thou art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy heads and thy flocks multiply, when your business is booming, your ministry is booming, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up. So it's a surgical operation that you don't know that is even happening. But small money that came. Hey, when your wife talks, she said, do you know who I am? But when you were in rags, you never asked that. When the going was tough, you never asked, do you know who I am? But now, because of multiplication of silver, multiplication of gold, multiplication of heads, you have built goodly houses. Hey! She dare not say anything. Because the girls in the office are falling for you. You don't know that is the money that is attracting them. I even told one brother that, oh, all these uh, affections, they are not real. Oh. They are just lying to you. He said, we like the lies. <laughs> We like the lies. Now, God doesn't say when you are hungry. He doesn't say when you lack. He says when you, are eat, you have eaten and you are full. That is when you should beware lest you forget the Lord your God. And faithfulness comes with prosperity. Now, you have a pot belly. You can afford expensive hotels. So every day you are doing lunch and, and you are clicking your hand. Wait up, bring this, bring that, you know? And then before you know, unfaithfulness has reared its head. So when you have eaten and you are full, that's when you should be cautious. Not when you have not eaten. When you have not eaten, maybe like Joseph also, somebody who has will appeal to you. But prosperity brings about this. And that is when people become polygamous. They don't become polygamous, especially often when they don't have anything. But when they have this, oh, my baby mama, I've bought a house for her at Cantonments, and I've even furnished it. It's your prosperity that's making you think a certain way and to look down on your spouse. Sometimes even some women, when they prosper, say, I've looked at him and he's not my type. Because now you go for certain meetings, you go for tendering, you tender at high places. So when you see your professional husband, he's a professional teacher. <laughs> but the Bible says riches don't last forever. And I've seen so many people that my mother even testifies to when things were good. They felt that they could just live anyhow. Now, 
the things have dried up and they are back. Somebody was 80, was negotiating with us that he didn't treat his wife well, but now he's come back. If he could please wed her. And the wife said, Mommy, me, never. Never again. <laughs> so please, prosperity can change you and lead you to unfaithfulness. Joblessness. Joblessness can lead to unfaithfulness. Because when you are suffering, the bills are not paid, things are difficult, and you get a sponsor. Amen. You said the sponsor is making things easy for me. And after all, what do I have to do? Sleep with him small in the office and I'm okay. For everyone listening online, you know that I'm dialing your number. And you know that what I'm saying is true. So sometimes your husband may lose his job. Redundancy. Then you say, hey, he's been sitting at home for eight months as if it's his choice. Some people may not make an effort, but some people do make an effort. And my mother told me something. She told me there are certain women that when their husband's job is not going well, or the husband loses a job for some time, they treat the husband with so much respect, you cannot even see that the husband doesn't work. And she does not spread it to everybody. Hey, he doesn't work, oh. so now I'm doing everything. Usually life is in seasons. I had a friend who had a very good job and her husband's business had fallen on bad times. And she said it's very hard because I don't see his contribution. I told her, I've come to see that there are seasons. So you are on duty now. So you flow. And you never know what in store in the future. You said that your husband is very generous. When he has, he will do all that he has to do. Oh, it came to pass that there was redundancy in her office. And she was one of the people. And around that time, her husband's business picked up. What didn't he do? He bought her brand new car. He bought her house. He... And I said, you see, you were complaining to me. And by having a little patience, things came together. Amen. But some of us too, we don't make an effort at all. Amen? Some of us, it's pure laziness, inability to recreate ourselves. We don't want to dream. Say, I've always been in the office, so I cannot do business. I will not try my hands at anything. I will always be this way. And then it leads to a lot of problems. So joblessness can lead to unfaithfulness. Be thou faithful unto death. Amen. Long separation. Long separation. First Corinthians 7, 8. A 5 to 8, the message Bible. Long separation. First Corinthians 7, 5 to 8, message Bible. Do you have it? Do you have a message here? Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time. If you both agree to it. If what? And if it's for the purpose of prayer and fasting. So the purpose should be for prayer and fasting. But only for such times. Then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. Amen. Paul says, come together quickly. King James says, let Satan tempt you. Then you, you have done long separation. You don't see your wife, your wife too doesn't see you. The Bible says that to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So that about the cacao, you don't like it, but when you are fasting, you see, say, hey, hey. so that girl is about the cacao. And because you have not built an environment of regular and uh, exciting sex, you are now doing abodekakro because there's been a long separation. Sometimes we have to choose 
between money and our marriages. Sometimes I say, oh, we've been married for 20 years, but 18 out of them, you were not here. And we are not like the world. The world can drink, uh, can eat groundnut soup, light soup, palm nut soup. We are not like that as Christians. Amen. So when we are taking decisions that involve long separation, we should be careful. I read something by Oral Roberts, and he said that he used to go for crusades for long times. But when he sees that in the hotel, his mind is now starting to think about the waitress and things. He closes the crusade down, he goes home. And that is how some of these patriarchs have been able to stay faithful. And so take decisions with some sense. Amen. Old age can affect your faithfulness. Old age. Abraham said, I'm old, and so is Sarah. How can we even have a baby? Even the activity car. And let me digress here to say that. Yes, sex is really related to age. That's why the Bible says, I enjoy life with the wife of your youth. So don't let the youthful days pass. Because a time is coming, things will not work like they are working. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I met some silly sister who is in our church, but I met her outside Ghana. She said, hey, Auntie Mami, now I can't believe it's my husband. I said, why? She said, hey, he needs a lot of encouragement before the equipment will work. I said, really, what are you saying? She said, hey, every day I do a siesta. I never thought there would be a time like that. And I said that. That is why the Bible says that the crown does not endure forever. So the wife of your youth. You see, God is counseling us in it. All, that when you are youthful, enjoy each other to the max. Amen. Before your pension days come. Some of you, you are not even on pension. You are young, but you are early retirement <laughs> and let us also seek help when we need help because there are many medical things that can be done you see but we refuse it's like oh I'm embarrassed you don't have to be embarrassed you didn't choose but the fact is real so all that can lead to unfaithfulness if the man is far, far older and the little girl is a romping damsel, at a point she says, Ah, Dada, man, see me who ye. <laughs> Poverty also leads to unfaithfulness. I think it will be linked to joblessness. And then medical challenges. You see, the Bible says that Rebecca was barren. And so Isaac entreated her for her to the Lord. Isaac's main prayer topic was that he was interceding for Rebecca. Not facing her and being somewhere. And sometimes as a counselor, the women are keen to get medical help, but the men, their ego and their pride. So I'm not going there. I'm not going to the clinic. I'm not. What is that? <laughs> that is, by the way, anyway. When we find ourselves in any of these circumstances, we must be on high alert for temptations because we are being tempted to be unfaithful. Now, there are some high-risk jobs. The Bible says that he that hews wood will be, I mean, his, his, his uh, occupational hazard will be in the wood that he's hewing. Yeah. Amen. Please, do you understand what I'm trying to say? 
He that, I think we have an account proverb which says that it's the person who goes to the river who gets his pot broken. So the model marriage is saying that there are some jobs that are prone to unfaithfulness and we have to be careful about them. Amen. It mentions airline workers. Do you know why? Your first lady's former job. <laughs> Shelly, that was a laugh. Anyway. <laughs> because when you go on, on airline, whatever, in the evening when you have landed, you all go and sleep in the same hotel. You are all tired. You've all been together in this capsule. You all come down for dinner. You all go after dinner. Mm? So, no, I'll come to what you should do. <laughs> I'll come to it, don't worry. So, airline workers, sailors, because you are separated for a long time and you are hungry, you are thirsty, you want to drink water. Amen? Somebody shared with me that when you work on oil rigs, it's a major temptation and that he was married all right. And then there was this lady who would bring him food in his bunker. The lady was married, but in the end, there was an unfortunate situation. So what should he do? He needs to take certain steps. It's not foolproof, but he needs to take certain steps. The Bible didn't say negotiate youthful lust. It said flee. Amen? So we'll come to that, hopefully. Then soldiers, because they go on peacekeeping. Long distance drivers. <laughs> Pastors. <laughs> because they give care. Do you see? So the person will be crying. Oh, Pastor, my husband left me. So oh, don't cry. Jesus said he will give you beautiful ashes. And you know. <laughs> lawyers because we deal with a lot of divorce cases I can tell you a number of lawyers who have had affairs with their divorce clients it's very common and we are taught in our ethics class to be very careful about that in fact a few years ago it was asked on a legal platform that somebody we knew had handled a case and they had gotten involved with a woman. So it was a legal discussion that has he breached the ethics? And the men were saying that was it during, before, or after the fact? <laughs> that did they get attracted after the case was finished? During the case or before? And I realized that all the females were saying that is immaterial. It is linked to the case. But they were saying it's not linked because if the case was finished before the whatever started, then it's after the fact and they have not breached it towards the whole discussion. Because lawyers deal with clients who are broken. So I know a lady, she had three children and she was seeing this lawyer for her divorce. After the case, they got married and had two more children. And the lawyer's first marriage was broken. So when you know, hopefully it prepares you. But human beings are human beings. And human contact is human contact. Do you understand? At the same time, you cannot be a non-empathetic lawyer. Hey, madam, so your husband has left. So what happened? I mean, you're supposed to be professional, but at the same time. And therein lies the temptation of unfaithfulness. Amen. I have here doctors also. But anyway. What are the conditions that are likely to aggra aggravate the potential for unfaithfulness? We have to settle the fact that unfaithfulness or infidelity is sin in God's sight. 
It normally has the end result of adultery, though it starts in seemingly harmless ways. Like when you spend more time with someone who is not your spouse. And usually when you concentrate on one person, it's going to be a problem. Amen? The following may, however, act as catalyst to this phenomenon, which is more of a problem of the heart. Sometimes there's something we call in law contributory negligence. So yes, the person may look like, oh, he wants to be unfaithful, she's drifting, whatever. But maybe you have also contributed to the situation. It's not always external. Amen? Some of it comes from us. That's why Jesus said, temptations are sure to come, but woe to them by whom? By whom they come. So it's not just the temptation, but you shouldn't be the cause or the catalyst for your husband or your wife or especially your husband's infidelity. Amen, ladies? So, becoming unattractive. Before you married him, you were smart, you looked nice at home. I know a lady, she said, Sister Mommy, I am too vain to not look nice at home. I am too vain. So I wonder why people make themselves bas -bas at home. I'm too vain. We are not talking about vanity. But you used to dress smartly. Your husband admired it. Yes, it's true, you've had two children, but it doesn't mean you should go into reverse. The Bible says that the virtuous woman, she is clothed in scarlet. And she makes herself clothing of tapestry. Amen. Actually, in the UD, Daddy believes that pastors should dress young so that they don't look sleepy and boring and it affects the congregation. So if you look at him first, love, I mean, you look at his get-up, you see that, yes. Amen. So ladies, you used to do your hair. Now you've stopped. They said, now you are two men in the house. You have put on Captain Haddock. You only put on a nice wig when you are going out. Yes, I know that it's hot. But you can do some styles that you have to put on top or wrap it so that Though you are not feeling hot, you are looking attractive. Amen. You have made the Ben Kwan the big uh, uh, stain. It's in your dress. And your husband is coming from a corporate meeting. The girl was on some major high heels. And she intentionally made her dress very tight. The men don't know it's intentional. But you and I know it is. And then he walks in to come to the house. You came earlier from work. It's true you are frazzled, you are, but you could have some nice jeans, shorts, you know, some ragged jeans, some t-shirt, you know, something attractive. And also smell nice. And when he says, Oh, come to the room, put off the stew and come to and say, hey, what do you mean to me? I'm in the midst of something. Try and be romantic. Amen, ladies. You don't upgrade your wardrobe. You wear jeans to sleep. Your night is old. Sometimes we contribute by being unattractive. Sometimes not even the outward, but you are unattractive in your responses. You are not encouraging. You are not nice. The same for the men. You are not nice. You haven't minded her. You are unattractive in your actions. Then when you come home, you want there to be action. She has not heard from you even, how is your day? Hmm. One pastor said to me, I used to do it before I married her. I don't know what happened. I said, yes, son, Kofa. <laughs> so becoming unattractive can lead or help the unfaithfulness. Amen. Not caring about things, your looks, your interest in sex, you, you, you don't care. 
general loss of interest in dressing, hair, and indeed general appearance. Infrequent sexual intercourse between couples. Huh? Proverbs 5, verse 15. Proverbs 5, 15 to 21. New Living Translation, please. NLT. New Living Translation. Okay. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets? Having sex with just anyone. Next one. You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Next verse. She is a loving dear, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. I have not finished, please. May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman? Or fondle the breast of a promiscuous woman? I didn't write the Bible, oh. Look, the word of God is light. Some time ago, I told my husband, I said, the Bible says, let her breast satisfy you. So let, permit, allow. So you, the man, it's your duty. You didn't get it, eh? But it says that drink water out of your own well. Bishop Dago asks, how many times do you drink water? Always. So ladies, often. Amen, ladies. <laughs> ladies, often. I'll give you a tip, ladies. Frankly speaking, how long does it last anyway? Frankly. Even if you tell me one hour, it will come to pass out of 24 hours. Amen, ladies. So, you see, let us just believe God's word and do it. The greatest sexual organ is your mind. And if you can renew it, you, some of you too, you were too SU for too long. So now, you have to remove your nun gown and be like a girl standing in a circle. Amen. But in the context of marriage, every day your, your husband is the one initiating. Amen. Go read Songs of Solomon. The woman was proactive too. In fact, the best person in this section is Sister Muna. She will come and teach you. She's very good. <laughs> Last week she was ministering at the Kodesh. All the men gave her offering plenty. Yes, because she's powerful. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> Perfect example. <laughs> Too nice. So infrequent sexual relations between a couple. Lack of communication. Lack of communication. The Bible says we should speak the truth in love. Couples don't discuss their sexual lives. But they should. Amen. A lot of wives are unhappy, but they don't say anything. They feel that it's not about them. That what you are doing, they are not happy. They are not, it's not pleasurable to them. But they are afraid that if they tell you, you will develop inferiority complex. Amen. So you should ask your wife, baby, what is it that when I do you, you really, you know? 
Then she said, oh, stop it, stop it. But she will tell you. Eventually. Amen. And if you have a teachable spirit, it will help you. All these are fighting and faithfulness. Amen. Some people are not married are saying, eh, me really, always I'll be available. <laughs> Lack of fellowship. You don't fellowship with each other, so the context of things, lack of communication, you don't know about each other, everybody's living their streams of life, you know, some things will not be perfect, but you may still have like 80%, 70% to work with. Amen. The Bible says, I know your strength, that it is small, but he still expects you to work with a small strength. Amen, ladies and gentlemen. So failure to sustain interest in one another. What is it that you have to make room? Some wives don't talk at all. Some husbands don't talk at all. We are not saying become Radio Ghana, but communicate. You communicate with your face. You communicate with your body. You communicate with the way you, you turn around when your husband calls you. Mm. Mm. It shows that it's not welcoming. Amen. So, communication is not only verbal. Fortnight marriages, where couples come together only fortnightly. I told you, drink waters out of your own system. You don't drink water fortnightly. So, over to you. Failure to share the same bedroom. No matter how angry you get, don't go to the guest room. Say it again. And I'm talking to some people here. Yeah. Again and again. No matter how angry you get, have that vow in your marriage that I'm not going to sleep in the hall and then she will sleep in the bedroom. And the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You are a Christian, but God's word doesn't matter. It has become like a, a graphic news. It can change. And they bring rejoinder. We are sorry that we described this, but it's actually this. God's word is not like that. And God's word is light for you and I. Amen. 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 So please. Hmm. Are you with me? First Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 7, verse 2 to 4. I'm rushing to the finishing so that you can ask your questions. So don't worry. First Corinthians 7, 2 to 4. The message Bible. Failure to share the same bedroom is very serious, but it is a real temptation, so you must fight it. Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them, unlike what you think. Amen? Hmm, where am I? But, no, I didn't finish, did I? Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. Isn't the Bible amazing? In a world of sexual disorder. Amen. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy the wife. The wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Hmm. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. I didn't write the Bible. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Yeah. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Amen. Do you know what King James says? Don't defraud one another. <coughs> but uh, you should give each other due benevolence. That's what he's calling service to one another. And he says, 
The husband's wife, uh, body is not for him. The wife's body is not for him. But ladies, in fact, we believe strongly that our bodies are for us. That is why with that brother who touched his wife in the dark, the wife said, who is that? And the husband replied, Atia is the one. Another one said, it's an armed robber. Amen. Because we honestly, when the Bible says renew your mind, it's, it's a very deep saying. Renew your mind. Because if these glasses belong to me, when I ask you, please pick them up from here, you will give it to me easily. Therefore, if your body does not belong to you, and your husband asks you for it, you will give willingly. Because it's not for you. Amen. And the brothers, if your body does not belong to you, you will give to your wife willingly. Somebody says you should take it. You should take it. <laughs> the brothers are donating their bodies generously. <laughs> Let's see. But please, this is not a laughing matter. It is God counseling us. It is God giving us light. It is God helping us. So renew your mind. Your body does not belong to you. Amen. When he touches a shenyoche, what is that? It's not for you. Amen. And the brothers, your body does not belong to you. So when your wife says, bring this body to sit and watch TV. The body is not for you. Amen, ladies. Trekking jobs also threaten unfaithfulness. Conditions that aggravate potential for unfaithfulness. Trekking jobs. The Bible says the prudent man sees the evil that is ahead. Somebody asked me, what do you do? You see the evil ahead. You know that this is the job I know. I do. You know that these are the temptations that come with it. And then you sit down and strategize how you are going to overcome. Amen. God help us. Turning down your spouse's sexual advances frequently. There are times when you can say, oh, today is not working for me. Oh, I have a headache. But when the headache comes every day at 9 p.m., then it's now too chronic. Mr. Patrick said, we'll just give you paracetamol and proceed. Amen, ladies. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hmm. NLT or message is fine, whichever. NLT or message. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. Ladies, a sudden good break. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Every day you are disappointing them. Every day no. Every day this. Every day that. And especially when he's annoying you. But that is why marriage is difficult. Because unconditional love is not easy. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be angry sometimes. But when you are angry all the time, frequently, there's something wrong. Amen, ladies. Hope deferred. It makes the heart say, every day, just a mommy, every day I ask her, every day I make a move, every day, I, so it's okay. As he's saying it's okay, he is not okay. And then when he steps out, a shrimp is calling him. You, he comes and you don't flow. But the shrimp is calling him. I will be calling you, oh beloved. Amen, ladies. These are serious things. And we need to renew our minds. Amen. Amen. The way some ladies are smiling, they look guilty. <laughs> Unhealthy work circumstances. Example. All is written in black and white here. A male and female 
working closely together in the same room for long hours. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 3. ESV, please. ESV. English Standard Version. Do you have it? The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. King James says the prudent man sees the evil that is ahead and keeps himself, but the simple go on and are punished. Go back to ESV, please. So you have to foresee evil. You don't wait when the evil comes and you say, oh. I didn't know that as we have come for the conference, I will have a room and you don't have a room, so you can share my room. Yeah, I dealt with a case like that. And the girl said, oh, we went to different islands, and every time I didn't have a room, so he said I could share with him. I said, ah, the coincidence is too much. <laughs> Three islands, all of it, you don't have a room. A conference, you are not proper. Amen. A prudent man sees the evil ahead. The book of Timothy says, flee youthful lusts. What did Joseph do? He fled from the presence of Potiphar's wife. But some of you would have sat down and said, oh, so you like me, eh? Oh, but you know, I'm married too. Let's read the Bible together. I have said this story over and over again, and it is a true story. One of our pastors, who is now a bishop, I went to preach in a town, and uh, we had PFI, Pastors Fellowship International, where we eat, let our head down, laugh. So I was talking about something. He said, hey, Auntie Mami, I've experienced it before. I said, what? He said, um, one day I was going to church. I saw a girl by the wayside. I picked her. I ministered to her. She gave her life to Christ. And then I told her I'll come and do follow-up. So she showed me her house. I went to do the follow-up. When I knocked on the door, she opened. She has put her cloth around here. So I told me, I went in. I said, you did what? I said, you did what? I said, excuse me, you are a fool. But the worst was yet to come. He said, so when I got inside, and my assistants got a bear witness because they were in that meeting. When I got inside, she lay on the bed and then she let the cloth loose. I said, so what did you do? I lifted my head and my Bible. I said, today we are dealing with... I said, you are the biggest fool I've ever seen. The Bible said, flee. It didn't say negotiate. It didn't say discuss. Flee. Are you wiser than God? I said, flee is between flying and running. He said, when I came out, then I saw that ye have been in hot fire. And the wife said to me, she was also them, she said, Mommy, I don't even know this story. I said, you are a fool. You lifted the Bible. Now, why is it trying to share for me? And she had heard it. And also, she could have gone to spread stories. Yeah. Why did you do that? So immediately, you say, oh, please, can you change? And then also, come, we'll sit on this veranda and have the meeting. You make straight paths for your feet so that you can walk in faithfulness. Amen. I remember going for a course in Asia years ago and it was a very small class and we were really close in it. We got, it was even Christians. We got on very well, whatever. And then there was this white guy who would always pay compliments. Oh, Adelaide, I like the way you dress. Oh, Adelaide, I like the way you carry yourself. I didn't think about anything, but as the course was progressing. I saw that he's always inviting me to dinner and the dinner will be alone and the whatever. And then we had graduation and then he came to talk to me and he said that, oh, this is our last night when we'll see each other. So he thought that we could take a stroll along the beach. There are ships and there are whatever. I honestly did not feel anything for him, but I thought about it that, hey, stroll, moonlight, by the sea. No, no, no. I don't think it's right. But it was a very beautiful tourist attraction and it was very expensive to go there. And he was going to pay all that in dollars. 
so that we go for that stroll. I said, this stroll, I would really like to go and see this nice, but at the same time, I see the evil ahead, and I have to keep myself. I'm far away somewhere, but no. So you two flee. Amen. And fleeing involves sacrifice. The sacrifice of not seeing that nice place, the sacrifice of not having that expensive dinner, the sacrifice of being by yourself in your room. But it's a sacrifice. If your marriage is important to you, Jesus said, take up your cross daily. What our cross is for is for crucifixion. So you crucify your desires, your impulses, and that thing that always rises in you. Amen, brothers? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Traveling together, staying in the same room, going on long courses abroad and short business trips, holding meetings in your room alone. Amen. <laughs> the Bible says, henceforth, have we no confidence in the flesh? I don't know why we, we, we trust our flesh so much. When Paul has said, we have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. So now, how do we foster faithfulness in marriage? Fear God. I think that if the fear of God is not there, forget it. Because Joseph was in a place, no fear of God, no whatever. He could have done what he pleased. When Abraham was approaching uh, where Abimelech was, he said, there's no fear. They will take my wife and just sleep with her. So there are places like that. But you stay true to the God who sees in secret and rewards you openly. I feel the Spirit of God telling me, some of you, you are already in trouble. But it's not too late to turn around so that God can shed his light on your path. Be prayerful because the Bible says it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jude 21, and you, beloved, building up yourselves. You need spiritual muscle. Amen? Building up yourself in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Spirit. Otherwise, you will be weak. And a lot of us are weak because we don't build our relationship with God. We are just like the secular world, and we fall under anything. But when you build your spiritual muscle, you get sustenance. Amen. Be active in church activities. Sometimes it's in the church activities that you find your temptation. That is when you have to need to flee. And I'll come to what else you can do. Amen. Avoid developing close relationships. That's point D in the book. Avoid developing close relationships with others of the opposite sex. Proverbs 6, 27 to 29. Proverbs 6, 27 to 29. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? <laughs> Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whoso toucheth her, shall not be innocent. You are holding fire. The sexual attraction is fire. You are keeping it to your bosom. You will be bent. Amen. <laughs> so avoid certain things that will put you in a funny position. It doesn't mean you should move around with suspicion. But have mutual friends. Sometimes it helps. Concerning the issue of childlessness that we talked about, remember that your partner will be who what and what God wants him to be. Genesis 32, Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead who has withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? It's not the person's fault sometimes, often, that he chose that situation. So you have to believe God. And, and explore ways like adoption, like in vitro fertilization, like, you know, explore ways. <clears throat> Wear your wedding rings always. If you've grown fat, go and adjust. The men especially. 
and wear. Amen. Wear your wedding rings always. Allah Bishop Dag, the book is by him. Don't leave things to conjecture. Talk positively, positively about your spouse. Remember the Bible says, a tail bearer separateth very friends. So don't talk to a third party negatively about your spouse. That will also inspire another. Because when you say to the person, my wife doesn't dry, dress well. When she comes to the office the next day, she's dressed well. Because you have shown her where your problem is. When you say, my wife's cookie is not nice, she will arrive at the office and say, oh, yesterday I made some jollof and I thought I'll give you some. She's using your problem to win you and the fool that you are, with all due respect, you are not seeing. <laughs> um, sit by your spouse in church. UD, you don't do well. Yeah. UD again. doesn't do well with that at all. Say it again, buddy. In the Kodesh, the pastors are in front and their spouses sit behind them. At least it's close. Because I think when they do spouse this, spouse this, I don't know whether it doesn't share. I don't know. But you must try to sit by your spouse. Because sometimes you go and tell the girl you are not married. Huh? Mm. I was just told about somebody in one of our branches chasing somebody I knew yesterday very strongly. And the person called him back and said, Hey, I hear you have a wife. You never said it. He said, Oh, but you, even when I make the advances, you say you don't like me. So what's your problem? <laughs> hmm. Now, the church of God has all sorts of materials. Be sexually active. We are talking about how to overcome. And infuse some variety and excitement into the marriage. When you read songs of Solomon, they are excited about each other. Amen. And Deuteronomy 4, there's what? Sister Muna. <laughs> Deuteronomy 4, there's what? Songs of Solomon, sorry. I meant songs of, songs of Solomon 4, verse 28. Verse 8, please put it there. Message. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Leave Lebanon behind and come. Leave your high mountain hideaway. Abandon your wilderness seclusion where you keep company with lions and panthers. Guard your safety. Uh huh. You've captured my heart, dear friend. You looked at me and I fell in love. What it means is that in the sexual relationship, you have to bring your wife from Lebanon. There are mountains, there are panthers, but bring her. We say in the model marriage that a man is like a light bulb. As soon as you switch it on, it's on. But the woman is like a pressing iron. So brothers, bring us from Lebanon, from a high mountain. Amen. <clears throat> You are not getting the revelation system. Muna will come up just now. So be sexually active, please. The excuses died in this room today. Amen. Find solutions to the causes of unfaithfulness that we have spoken about. You know, one of it is fleeing. One of it is having other companions who are not of the opposite sex so that you can hang out with them. But now there's another problem of gayism. Hmm. And finally, seek help before it's too late. James chapter 5 verse 16. James chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your faults. Make this common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. 
the prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Amen. King James says, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, confessing your faults doesn't mean the confession is happening at the same time always. That you are at fault, I'm at fault, so we are confessing our faults. One person can confess their fault, and then the other person will confess their fault in another forum. And I think that the Catholics have a forum where you actually confess to somebody who is spiritually mature. Amen. Amen. And that must be encouraged. I just want to read two more verses and then we are done. Um, Acts 19 verse 18. Acts 19 verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Amen. Let's go back to the first, the Acts 19.18. Let's go back there. Many that believed, we are all believers, they came and they confessed and they showed their deeds. There's too much hypocrisy in the body of Christ. There's too much deception. And there's too much sweeping under the carpet. There's too much play acting. We are wilder than Hollywood. You can quote verses. You speak in tongues. You are very wild, but beneath it is another person. But when you confess something, it's it loses its hold on you. So if you could come to your pastor and say, Pastor, I'm actually having an affair and I'm struggling. Pastor, like this lady who called me, Sister Mommy, I'm falling in love with this guy in my office and I need help. And she got the help she needed. And today she's happily married, still happily married with her three children. Amen. She couldn't confess to her husband. But she could confess to somebody she thought would give her godly counsel. Amen? And I was, I was able to tell her, this is sin, this won't wash. I'm sorry you need to change offices. I'm sorry you need to tell them, you know, you are just not comfortable being in the office with this guy. You say it in a way, you know, and they changed her. And also she stopped receiving the croissant and things in the morning. She would just say, oh, no, thank you. I had breakfast with my husband this morning. I am so full. And I told her, force and have breakfast with him if it means something to you. Amen. So confession is only those who confess who are forgiven. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. First John 2 verse 9. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These people were believers. They came. And they confessed. And they showed their deeds. Don't use imagery. Don't use onomatopoeia. Don't use uh, euphemism. All these are literature words for describing things. But call a spade a spade. And not an agricultural instrument. Tell us I'm having an affair. Tell us I'm struggling with this girl. Tell us I'm struggling with this man. Because nowadays... I don't know whether I should make the infidelity 50-50. In my time, it was more the men. But nowadays, what I'm seeing, huh, I feel dizzy. Amen! I don't know whether it's the internet. I don't know whether it's human rights. The women are something else. The women are something else. And they are all in the church. Some of them serve. Amen! Some of them are very active. I've seen. Very, very, very active. There was one lady, she was in a branch, and somebody came to report her. And everybody said it can never be. So I asked people in her branch, do you know this lady? I mentioned her name. Yes. How is she? Oh, mommy, the best shepherd you could ever have. Even things that don't concern her, she comes to church just to serve. I mean, her love for God is phenomenal. And I had this story in my backpack. 
And I knew it was a true story because um, an unbeliever had tried to contact me to tell me, this is going on, just because I went to invite her to breakfast meeting. He said, I should come so that you sleep with, people sleep with me. I was like, oh, why are you saying that? Eh, because, it, and she even had a recording of all that had happened. I put it off for like three times. I said, oh, it's because of our pastoral care. People read into it, and I don't think, and... Anyway, lo and behold, it proved to be true. But when I was trying to find out about the ladies, who oh, the best shepherd ever, the best whatever. So you are the best shepherd ever, but you have another life. And at night, you are somebody else. Amen. And she never confessed it or brought her deeds. Never showed her deeds like these people did in the book of Acts. And when you don't do that, the, Satan has you in his grip. You know, the Bible says a righteous man will fall seven times, but he will rise again. So it's not so much even the falling, but getting out of that hole and bringing healing and restoration to you. It will take you confessing. It will take you being truthful. It will take you shedding the light. Like, I'm having a problem here. And nobody is going to condemn you. It's just help. Jesus came for those who are sick. But when you go to the doctor, you don't tell him you're having a fever. You don't tell him you're having chills. You don't tell him, how can he diagnose that malaria? He doesn't know your symptoms. But when you tell the doctor what it is, then we can describe and prescribe the right medicine for you. We are too hypocritical. I mean, I don't know. It's almost as if, if I say I have a problem in my marriage, my wife will chew me up. Why? You are suffering. If I say I have a problem, my husband will leave the church. It depends on how it's handled also. Amen? People are mature and people know these things. So it is good to talk to somebody. Job, Job said, when I keep the thing in me, it's best. But I'll speak so that I'll have life. So speak, vent. Amen? No marriage is perfect. <clears throat> and also, marriages go through seasons. Your winter is now. Somebody's winter is later. Amen. And even when you share it, you find out that everybody has the same problem. Amen. And sometimes you see that even your own is kindergarten. <laughs> and somebody else is postgraduates. Amen. I believe that we are not just called by God to be faithful just because it's nice. But because, you know, the Bible says that he that breaks the hedge, a serpent will bite you. So you make room for the devil. Ephesians 4, make, give no place to the devil. But we make place to the devil. And at the end of the day, whether I'm believers, they all come to that same point. And they always lament, oh, I made such mistakes. If I wish I could go back, so many. When I asked my husband, my mother, she said, oh, all of them always come to the same point. Then she will, she will begin to mention, lawyer, this, architect, this, this one. This one, this one, this one. It looks like the statistics are high. Because God's word can never be broken. So, after this meeting, let God change your heart and your desires. And, want, and, and give you a desire that wants to please him. That has the fear of God, you know. And God knows that we can't do it on our own. That's why he says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall quicken our mortal bodies and make us able. And also when you often, when you get involved with the things of God, you don't have a lot of time to go and fool around. But when you are idle, the Bible says about the virtuous woman, she does not eat the bread of idleness. You are idle. That's why you can watch that pornography all the time and be dissatisfied with your partner. I went to a girl's school and I was surprised. No Wesley girls though, but I mean <laughs> sin is everywhere. And they came to me and said, oh, we are addicted to pornography. Girls. I'm like, I thought it was a male problem. But they are girls. And they are going to get married. And nobody knows. So that when you marry them, you know, somebody once said to me that, because of all that I've been exposed to, when my husband sleeps with me, I feel that he's a small boy. The corruption has gone on, whereas the corruption could have been corrected. Amen.
The Bible says, let them who are married be as though they were not. And let those who are not married be as though they were. It means that don't let that state be a fixation. The main thing is to make it to heaven. The main thing is to receive his well done. But we will give an account of our lives. The Bible says everything we have done, whether good or bad. And I pray that faithfulness will come into our marriages and even our relationships. And I pray that lying and deception will be far from us. And I pray that <clears throat> we will seek help when we need help and not feel that we have to present this perfect life. Look at the people in the Bible. They made terrible mistakes. Abraham slept with his maid. Although it's not he who went for the woman. T.D. Jake says he has never seen a woman like that who will happily give the husband another woman. But they exist because I dealt with a case like that where the housemistress used to call the lady to sleep with her husband because a woman does. The girl ended up be being very promiscuous. Somebody I know. She couldn't be faithful. She couldn't be faithful. And she married like twice. She couldn't be faithful. Everybody she saw and she told me the genesis of this is my house. And she said she used to cry. And the housemistress would stuff her hair panty in her mouth. So that when she cries, they won't hear. So you, you are helping me. I mean, there are very lurid things in this world. But Christ came to set us free. Hallelujah. And we can be free indeed. I think that if we had this, it would lead us less to divorce court, which is very rife now among Christians. Very, very rife. In fact, they say that in America, unbelievers rather are staying married. And Christians are. So I believe that that's why this topic was chosen. And I pray that God will bring healing. And we have to do practical things to keep our marriages intact. I want to hear news from various homes that the women are very active and the men are begging. That can happen. God being our helper. Amen. Please sit down. I think this deserves another round of applause. Why don't you rise to your feet? Our marriages are being healed. We are receiving direction for our lives. Amen. Episcopal, as I said, don't present a very nice situation. Hallelujah. Share your problem and you'll be helped. Another round of applause. Amen. Now, I want you to keep your questions coming in. Because she's here to do justice to every question. Hallelujah. And whilst we wait, we have our sister Nana, Lady Pastor Nana in the house to give us song ministration. With a round of applause, let's welcome Lady Pastor Nana. Hallelujah. Um, I'm sure we are aware this is a special edition of our model marriage conference so some ladies will be coming around with some drinks and snacks whilst we enjoy the song ministration i have some of the questions here so after the ministration i'll read them out but you're also encouraged to write your questions there are some papers going around with pens so write your questions and then we will attempt to answer it by the grace of god amen Yeah. 
To articulate my feelings I would give a lecture in prompt to Cause I cannot elaborate Or verbalize enough to say I simply I love you How do I love you? I could count forever But Webster's definitions are too few 
when I break the bottom line The only words that make sense I simply, I love you I know your love is unfathomable Your ways are unequivocal Your heart is undeniably true But it's actually impossible To find the perfect syllable To describe the indescribable you Oh, if I had the prudence to expound on my philosophy I'll tend to wait or see this all the time Socrates will envy me Einstein will read my mind Multitudes will congregate To hear me pontificate Scientists will upright The things that I had emphasized Shakespeare will convert Before he wrote a single line Oh, but this is just to me Without the ceremony I mean it's so sincerely simply I love you Oh yeah, I love you Hallelujah Great, are we ready for the question and answer time? Beautiful. We know that our mother is graced with the anointing to answer questions. And we are going to do this in 15 minutes. 15 minutes and we'll be out of here. Okay? So, mommy, the first question is, how do you overcome vagina dryness? This is a medical question. <laughs> Hello. It's a medical question. I think that even in the model marriage, before you marry, you are advice to use a lubricant so it's still it's still the same answer medically i think yeah you you need the model marriage book from this your question <laughs> i yeah. think you can use an oily based lubricant not the water base i think ah, okay ky gel is water based oh, but okay. even anointing petroleum oil does jelly. magic yes petroleum uh, jelly uh, even anointing vaseline. oil does magic it does magic, anointing yes, oil. <laughs> Second, he says, should a wasteful and lazy husband who happens to be the head manage the finances of the home where the wife works so hard and brings more money? I would say that, yes, the husband is the head. But in like any corporate situation, sometimes the bosses know their weaknesses. So they delegate the part that they are not strong in. So I would advise such a husband to delegate the financial part to the wife because maybe she's better at keeping the finances. And it's also even in our model marriage. You know, sometimes you are not good in a certain area. Your wife is good in that area. It doesn't take away from you the headship because as a CEO, you can delegate things and departments you want to delegate. So I think that we should recognize what we are good at. One husband was in my office last week he told me he's terrible with money. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I said, like what? He said, Auntie Mommy, I earn a lot. But if you ask me what I use the money for, I can't tell you. And it's not like I've used it for anything. But my wife is very good. So I let her take care of the finances and it's helping us. But not every husband will be that humble. But I think that we should use each other's strength for the benefit of the union. Great. Oh, be generous with your clapping. How does one treat a disrespectful wife, always insulting you during petty arguments? I think you can report her. <laughs> Tell her pastor, because most people respect their pastors, but not everybody respects their husbands. Most people respect maybe church members, but may not respect their wives. So I think that you can mention to the pastor, and the pastor can call her and then uh, minister to her and talk to her. Yeah. And also, have you told her that when she uses abusive language, you don't succumb, uh, subscribe to that? And also, what do you define as rude? Some people, when the wife says, I don't agree, it means she's rude. It doesn't mean that. So... I think that a higher authority will be able to help you. Just like when we have disputes and we can't settle them, we take them to court. And the court has different hierarchies. You start from district. Up on him. 
I don't think is healthy. And um, I think that if you are the woman doing that, perhaps the two of you must discuss the extent. But every day, video call, why should the person see you every day? It's not necessary. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. So we have to be careful. You don't have to put confidence in the flesh. And also, if your spouse did that, would you like it? You wouldn't like it, so I think. How would you spice up your sex life if your spouse complains of being tired almost every day? Maybe you help her with the chores. If even you are not the one actively helping, you can get her help. Or you can get labor-saving devices. Or you can say, oh, this weekend, let's send the children to my mom or your mom so that we can have time together. I mean, and also show that you care about her concerns. But ladies, we will always be tired. As I'm sitting here, I'm tired. We will always be tired. So I think that tiredness is not a good enough excuse. You know, and that you can overcome your tiredness. It shouldn't be always, always, always. Okay? So, um, help her to get less tired. And hopefully, it will help. Somebody said, give her paracetamol. Please, how should couples have their quiet time? Should it always be together? Well, there's a popular as you say, the family that prays together stays together. I'm sure it's true. But in my own life, it has never been like that. Um, I grew up in a home with morning devotion with my dad, my mom. And I remember in the early stages telling my husband that that's what I knew. And then he said to me, okay, I haven't seen that before. So you implement it. But the implementation wasn't easy. So in the end, we ended up teaching our children how to have quiet time on their own which is good, but I regret not also bringing in the morning devotion part more often. So um, if I could change something, I would change that. Um, but I also dealt with a couple recently where the man says that the woman forces him to have morning devotion with her and he doesn't want. So I told the woman, it's causing too much friction and too much problem. So you leave it, you pray, and then he also prays. I remember Kenneth Hagin Jr.'s wife saying that she, she doesn't want to pray with her husband because he is her prayer topic. So, <laughs> if she's praying with him, she will not be able to say a lot of things. So, all of us need our space with God. But what I would say in my life we have done is we do pray together if we have something in particular to pray about, and sometimes a prayer of agreement. And then we pray together when, let's say, we are traveling. Or so it's not zero, but I wish that having been brought up that way, I had inculcated that a bit more. So the ones who still have time should do that. Why is it that some pastor's wives don't like giving their husbands sex? This can lead to serious unfaithfulness. Please address this with strength because it's very difficult for some of us. It has been addressed with strength. And also the way you are talking, I can see you are not a pastor's wife. So just become one and you will see that's not so easy. But I think that I've addressed it. I think that, ah, uh, the pastor who is asking the question. I think that it's too cliche to just say they don't like. It's true, but I think that, um, you see, if you talked to a woman, which men find tiring, you could draw her. What does Solomon say? Draw me after you and let us run together. But usually, you want us to be like you. And you want us to be light bulbs like you. You know, excuse me to say, I was telling some pastors that because women don't have anything that rises, you think they are always game. <laughs> I don't know if you understand, but... <laughs> You think that they are always game, but they are not always game. Just like you are not always game. Sometimes you are stressed. Sometimes They also have that, but just that the type of equipment God gives them does not relate to that. So I think that um, 
The women have said have to renew their minds. The mind is the greatest sexual organ. But the men too, you see, if you are made this way in the shape of this cup, you can't say that you should become square. So having said all that, the Bible says dwell with her according to knowledge. How does her body work? What turns her on? What makes her happy? After you've spoken hush, 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 then you go to the room and say, Obaros, kopiem, unkoyeden wopiem. So we need to also sow the right seeds. But when I say that, I'm a bit hesitant because the woman who said, Auntie Mami said, sow the right seed. So it's going to take you 10 years to sow the right seed. You know, so let's just, like the Bible says, serve the other and the other also serve us. And I think that that will help. And past, is it pastor's wives? I think it's women. Who, I don't think it's pastor's wives. But maybe pastor's wives are more in the public domain, so their issues are talked about. Thank you, Mami. How can we communicate effectively in marriage? I think there's a whole chapter in modern marriage on communication in marriage. And many of us, when the counseling was going on, post uh, premarital, we didn't hear. So you need to read. It's not going to, the knowledge is not going to come to you by osmosis. You need to buy, speak the word. If uh, preaching is a, a problem for you, so that you can hear the word, even just hearing about temperaments, it just lifts your spirit and gives you some knowledge, although you, you, you think you know. You know, so let's go after knowledge. Let's seek it with all our hearts. And I believe that it will set us free. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So having said that, what are the practical things you can do for communication? I am learning that I don't have to share my thoughts necessarily in the same forum. Do you understand? If my husband is talking to me and saying, Mommy, this thing, this, 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 this. Remember that I'm a lawyer and I'm learned, I've learned to think on my feet. So I'm used to saying, objection, my Lord. I don't say that in my marriage. But so I'm thinking. As you are speaking, I'm thinking. And I'm sometimes seeing the loopholes in what you are saying. That, ah, but why do you use this word? It means this. It doesn't mean that. I don't say that. But so it makes you speak that, oh, it's not that. But it's not. It doesn't have to be in that forum. The Bible says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So I'm still a work in progress, but I'm learning to be quick to hear and to be quick to want to uh, please you. So then I have to shelve what I have to say so that you will believe that I've heard you and I have to genuinely hear you and then work with what you have said. And then later, I can come back and say, oh, this thing that you said, actually, there was also this aspect. And that makes a person more willing to hear you. But when it's back and forth, it becomes a shouting spree, and nobody gets anywhere. So I think that we should fine-tune that. And I think ladies usually speak faster than men and think faster than men. So our mouths are very fast, and we often don't say things well like the... The question was saying that the wife is very rude with what she says. But I also like to ask what the definition of rudeness is. Because for some of you, if she says, I don't agree, it means she's rude. I don't agree with that. Because even God, when he said he was going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, what about if they are 50? What about if they are 40? What about if they are 20? What about if they are 10? And God didn't say, I'm God. When I decide to destroy, don't ask me about 50, 40, and 20. No. He spoke to Abraham. And in the end, he changed his mind. You too, be gracious like God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Mommy, please, how do I deal with a husband who doesn't know how to say sorry and a husband who is still attached to his family after marriage? The key of acceptance. <laughs> because I'm sure you've been married for a while. You've tried to change him, that he should learn to say sorry. He is not saying it. Sometimes we are, we are socialized by what we grew up in. I'm not saying it's right, but 
He's seen it and seen it and seen it before he met you. So it's very difficult for him to change, you know. And we have in the model marriage the prayer on serenity. Lord, grant me the wisdom to know the things I can change and to know the things I cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. So there are certain things you will spend your whole life fighting and never enjoy your marriage. And before you know, one person has gone to be in the grave. Because you are changing the unchangeable that only God can change. Please, am I making sense? So don't let something you don't have mar the rest of what you have. And if it's attached to his family, you too get attached to them. Because sometimes, uh, what if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> you know, so you can also be attached to his family and that may give you an inroad. Again, you can seek pastoral help because he probably doesn't know that there's anything wrong. And when you say it, he just feels you are being selfish. But maybe if he came for pastoral counseling, the pastor will tell him practically some of the things. Maybe he's neglecting you. The Bible says that he that does not take care of his own is worse than an infidel. So all that will come into play. You see, marriage things are difficult to answer with a pat answer. Because usually, there's a whole background, there are two sides, there are so many things. In fact, there are three sides. Your side, her side, and the truth. You see, so... <laughs> Mommy, should I marry a woman who is not spiritual or as strong as I am spiritually? Hmm, I wouldn't advise it. But I don't know what you mean by spiritual. Is it spiritual that she has the fruits of the Spirit? Is it spiritual that she loves God and the things of God? Is it spiritual that she has a certain spiritual understanding which we need? For instance, a lot of ladies think they want to marry pastors. But are they really ready to pay the price? There's a price. Amen? If you are married to Billy Graham, half the time he's not home. Ruth Graham fell from her tree, her spine, her back, her this. He's not there. And she had to raise the five children on her own. And the boys, she says, were the most difficult. Frankly, Graham started smoking at the age of 12. Because some workmen came to their house and they were smoking. He went to be with them. And by 13, he was drinking whiskey. He got sacked from university about four times. Today, he's the head of Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. So, and one of the daughters has actually written a book, Abandoned, because she feels that her, has, her father being an evangelist abandoned her, and because of that, she had abandonment issues. But she said she didn't know, but a friend said to her, do you think you have abandonment issues? And that set her on that road, you know. So, um, before you say I do, <laughs> you should... Find out whether the, the road the person is going to walk on. Is it a road you walk on? Some of them say, oh, I really want to marry a missionary. I just want to do God's work. And then when you have to go, he goes. And then for one year, you have not joined him. And then you say, I said it, but I've changed my mind. You see, so... But I think that when a woman loves God, a man loves God, her decisions and choices will be based on that the fear of God, and that helps you. Because even when I don't feel like forgiving, if the word of God says I should forgive, I may cry, I may whatever, but God's word is something I fear. So because of that, I will force and do God's word. Whereas somebody else will say, for Bible, don't turn and I am manifesting. So it depends, you know. Some people too, they look spiritual for you. Because they hear from the pulpit that if she's not active in church, don't marry her. If she doesn't belong here, so she has gone to join all so that she will attract you. That's why we need to pray. What does the Bible say? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So you need to pray about who you are getting married to. Some people are genuinely spiritual, but somewhere along the journey, something happens. And if it's God's will for you, then it's God's will for you. I hope I've answered. Yeah. My beloved is a very nice person, and I believe she'll be a good wife. However, I'm in trouble. 
I'm troubled by her body count, into brackets, slept with a lot of men. When I think about this, I lose interest in her. Should I go ahead with the marriage or manage this feeling? It depends on you. Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her, but Jesus still added her to the women who ministered to him. So it depends on you, but some people marry these women who are forgiven, who are cleansed, and then they have a lot of issues. I've seen it. They have a lot of issues in the marriage. In fact, I have a prominent <laughs> pastor friend who shared this story with me that the couple got married, he blessed it. And the first night, the lady thought that she was making the man very happy. So she did a lot of moves and a lot. And the man said, hey, you are too macho. You are too experienced. And she felt that she should bring her experience to bear in the bedroom. And he told me the marriage broke. But he told me, he's a pastor, so he told me that, I mean, outside the UD, he told me that when he was doing the counseling, he felt what a lucky man. When the man was saying, they were sitting, the two of them, she does this, this. Hey, the man is blessed, but then at the end, the man said, no, so I can't marry. <laughs> you know, because she has slept with so many people, but if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, and sometimes the one who is forgiven much loves God much. You know, so it depends on you. But if you are struggling with it, it is likely you will struggle with it also in marriage. So let her go and let somebody who deserves her pick her up. Is sex the only avenue of unfaithfulness? And is a woman who rejects sex not the same as Sarah? Uh, Sarah did not reject sex. So where did you read that verse from? <laughs> Uh, Sarah leading her husband to have sex with another woman, her maid. <laughs> and so, what's the beginning of the question? Is sex the only avenue of unfaithfulness? Only avenue? I don't yes. understand. No, there are different things you can be unfaithful with, with and sometimes... With the profession. Uh -huh, and even there's something called emotional adultery, yeah. where you are so emotionally hooked on the person, but you don't know. Then you say that, no! I do projects work with her. I do, but when the person is not there, you feel not together. And, so, and you are always wanting your phone to call. Hey, brother, sister, you're on the wrong road. You're on a, a dangerous road. You know, so no. Sex is the main avenue, but not always. I hope I've answered your question. And you said that. Is a woman who rejects sex not the same as Sarah, leading her husband to have sex with another Sarah's woman. Sarah's problem was not sex, it was childlessness. And she felt that since she was barren, she should give her husband a young woman who was fertile to have the child. So please, let's rightly divide the word of God, okay? Please, I'm not married, but I'm having a beloved, and it's like I'm forcing him in everything, especially in church activities. Please help me. It's not going to change. <laughs> What you see, multiply by a thousand. Yeah, see so like Bishop says. What you see, you are so. Do you understand? Yeah, so it's not going to change. So I always tell people, what you see, ask yourself, can I live with it? Because everybody has a left leg. So ask yourself, can I live with this? And if you can't, bow out. Yeah. But you go and take another problem. Maybe not this problem. But another one. So if he doesn't try, he's not into church activity. When he marries you, to become worse. Dear Auntie Mami, please, how do you deal with a wife that is hypersexual? Hey, a lot of brothers will like fight with sex. She doesn't seem to be satisfied. After sex, yeah. Maybe you should ask her what will satisfy her. But yes, I know that sometimes it's the women who are active and the men are dull. And we just assume that it's always the other way around, but not always. So a woman who is hypersexual, you said she's never satisfied. Is that what he said? <laughs> she's dissatisfied. Maybe there's something you can do. So that's why I said couples should communicate on that level as well. 
Mommy, please, what will make a wife never ask her husband for sex? Meanwhile, her husband is good looking, can give her good sex, and has time for her too. Can you please inform them that this is really unacceptable? We did not <laughs> marry them to watch them as television. What? Whom? Are they expecting us to, have love, to make love to? Mommy, please help us. <laughs> So what is the question? The question is, <laughs> the wife doesn't give him sex. And the wife is saying that the man is handsome and everything. Is the, is the man who's saying that uh -huh. the wife never asks for sex, but he's handsome, he's good looking, and he can give her good sex, and he has time for her too. I think, I think, and as Paul says, this is not a Bible verse. But I think that just like our capacity for food, some people want sex less. Honestly. Like some people eat a lot. And some people, they eat a little and they are full. I think that that also exists. But God is not expecting us to stay there. Do you understand? Because he says that use your body to serve the other. So I think that if she has that scripture, then how you are handsome and powerful, she will flow. <laughs> but... Maybe you are handsome, you are powerful, but you don't also turn her on because you, you shout at her, you don't show any love, you are so mechanical, you are whatever. She's likely to, if she had anything that will rise, it will never rise. <laughs> A word to the wise. <laughs> I mean, so if ordinary discussions or trying to plan for the family is almost likely to end in misunderstanding, what should one do? Um, hmm. You have to maybe talk, the two of you, as to how things can be. But if every talking leads to that, then you may have to go to a higher authority or find ways, because it won't be perfect, but you can find ways of Communicating certain things, but not, I don't know. And then also, let's not leave out prayer. Because God answers prayer, and God changes people and things. Okay, prayer is important. Mommy, please, I want to speak about the, I want you to speak about the importance of the man giving money to the wife. Not only when the woman asks for loan. Yeah, brothers, be freely giving. Be freely given. Be freely given. The arm strong is too much. And it shouldn't be always your wife has to ask you, can I get money for my hair? Please, can I get some small money for my dress? Please help me. With, it's, it's too much. And that's even what makes women say, I'm going out to work. I want my own money because everything I have to ask him. I have to ask him, my bra is old. My panty is... Just give her money that she will use for herself. And she will bless you forever. Pardon? Ah, yeah. Some of you, your accounting is too much. I went to two peppers, two onions, receipts and things. I mean, just flow. Okay? Amen. Okay. Mommy, can your partner check your phone charts in the night when you are asleep, even though she knows you are not doing anything? Most of these things, well, they bring a lot of problems. And also a lot of unnecessary problems to you, the checker. You know, but sometimes you have done something for her to suspect i've dealt with a case like that for what she has seen and what you are doing you are not telling her the truth and when she's coming you hide and all that may lead to that but i think that ladies we can spare ourselves that and what god wants to reveal he will reveal but sometimes it also takes wisdom to look but usually i would say i think we're asked this question at the joy fm whatever about phone i would say that it brings a lot of problems so if you can help it chill
My husband cheated on me multiple times. When I confronted him, he kept lying and denying everything. But when I decided to leave or divorce him is when he decided to tell me things. Every time I look at him, all I can think about is him with another woman. How can I move forward with my marriage? I am trying my best, but it's difficult. My father cheated on my mother, and now my, father has, my husband has cheated on me. I want to break this generational case and fix my marriage. Amen. God bless you for wanting to fix your marriage. It's going to take a lot of grace and mercy from you towards your husband. And also, you must talk about it because trust has been broken. So you need him to restore that trust. Um, I'll say this because, well, maybe not. It was public, but I'll, uh, a, a prominent uh, guy, not African, had an affair in his office for some years. And when the wife found out, she was really devastated and all that. And she also wanted to leave. But when they spoke about it, he decided that he will now put his wife on all his emails. He will give her the password to his phone because he said that he needed to build trust with her because trust had been broken. So if trust has been broken, you and your husband can speak. And he may do certain things that you think will help you restore the trust. You also need to pray to God because he's the one who helps us so that you can be forgiving and also that the root of bitterness will not have its hold. And then also you need a lot of emotional and mental support which you may get from your church or from your lady pastors so that they can check on you and you can tell them when the going is rough so that they can minister to you. But you have to Believe God to forget what lies behind and build what lies ahead and you can have a good marriage. Ma'am, what exactly is submission? <laughs> In Ephesians 5, 21, the Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another out of reverence for God. So submission is not only a female thing. Ephesians 5.21 says we should submit to each other. Then 22 comes to say, wives, submit unto your own husbands. So submission is not a, a command just for the woman. There's the verse before saying, submitting yourselves one to another. So that comes first. And then the wife submitting to you. And the Bible continues to use the word Submit. Say, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So submission is not a negative thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not a thing associated with slavery. But it's a thing associated with love. You know, because there can't be two captains in a ship. You know, and somebody has to give in so that peace will move on. So that's what it means. But if you, the husband, are supposed to also love the wife who is submitting as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It makes the woman uh, not fight the submission too much because she knows you love her and you are coming from a good place. But it is not tit for tat that if you don't love me, I won't submit. If you don't submit, I won't love you. It's not like that. The Bible says, as unto God. And it's God who rewards. So the world has made submission a very bad thing. But you submit to your boss. If you are in the military, you submit to a captain. You submit to a major. You submit to the head of state. You submit to the laws of Ghana. You submit all the time. And it's not an issue. But when they say, submit to your own husband, then it becomes an issue. And so I don't think that it should be couched in that way. But submission is also supposed to be met with love. So if you love somebody, you won't enslave her. If you love somebody, you will not kick her around because she has to submit. If you love somebody, you will not uh, uh, tell her, shut up and all that. You wouldn't do that. You know, so God intended the two to work in sync. So let's do that so that it works. So um, I'm coming to the question line. The last two questions. Mommy says, what premium would you place on sex and marriage? And he says, if prayer answered all things, 
why is it that some marriages are still broken even when prayers are offered? Because God can only do his part. If the two people are not doing their part, it will break. Amen? Or if the two people cannot like let God be who he is or act in a certain way, it will break apart. It's like saying that God said he will help you with your exams. Then you don't learn. Then you say that. You don't study. Then you say, oh, why did God not let me pass the exam? Because there's a part that you also have to play. You know, so prayer answers everything, but prayer also depends on you and your willingness to go along with God's word. But there was a, a question before that. The, what premium would you place on sex and marriage? I think it's very high, a very high premium, if not the highest. Because, like they say in the model marriage, everything else, God allows other people to do it. Somebody else can cook for you. Somebody else can clean your house. But this one, God says, it should be in the context of marriage. But that's why Christianity is not easy and it's also very um, unique. Yeah, so that is the high premium that we place on sex. So ladies, don't let it just be a talk shop. Change your minds. And today begins the change. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, mommy. Oh, can we give mommy a round of applause? Hallelujah. How many have been blessed? It's not a question to even ask. Hallelujah. I believe we've all been blessed. Your questions have been adequately answered. And we are so privileged and blessed to have Mami here. She's going to pray for marriages. Hallelujah. For those who are online, I believe that a prayer can change things in your marriage. And for those of us who are here also, that prayer will change your marriage. Amen. So I want us to put our hands together. Let's welcome our mother once again. Hallelujah. Shall we pray? It's not by might. It's not by power. Oh, by my spirit. Red says the it's not by my it's, it's not, not by mine it's, it's not, not by my they cannot do for themselves oh god step into marriages step into homes step into relationships you are the one who mends jesus you are the one who turns ashes into beauty do that for your people i speak to every home i speak to every life represented here i speak to every marriage and including those online I ask for the Holy Spirit's touch that God alone will turn things around some of you are saying Lady Reverend Episcopal Sister I'm looking at ashes how do I go forward but God is saying I will turn beauty I'll give you beauty in the place of ashes this evening he's asking you to give him ashes so that he can give you beauty oh father let there be a turn around let the discourage find courage let the lame feet be healed that they will not be turned out of the way let the weary be strengthened bring hope lord in hopeless situations bless bless and let no sorrow be added oh god give 
your people light. Give your people wisdom. Give your people the way forward. Bring healing in all the broken places. Your word says that you will make mountains. You will make wells of dry places. Let that be their story, Lord. Heal the heart that is crying. Heal the heart that is reaching out to you, Lord. God of impossible situations, do miracles. And let there be testimonies. Oh, build our homes, oh God. Even if there are floods, let the homes stand because they are built on you. May your people go back, Lord, and build with the fear of God. And build with your word, Lord. Let it be settled in our homes. And deliver us from Satan and all his antics. Thank you. You are able to do far more exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or imagine or ask you for. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Somebody, I think you can make some holy good crazy noise. Hallelujah! Mommy, on behalf of all your audience around the nations of the world who are watching you, we want to say thank you so much for coming once again. We have never met resistance. It's always been you giving yourself and saying, I'm ready to come. And for that, we are very, very grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, let us put our hands together and thank Mommy. A great gift of God to the body of Christ. We cherish you so much. We love you so much. And we know that you are touching homes, touching lives, touching families. And may God continue to replenish every virtue that you have lost in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.